Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table. We discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Daryl Bach, Executive Director for Cultural Engagement at the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary. And my guest is Dr. Michael Spiegel, who is chair of the Systematic Theology – well, do they call it Systematic Theological, theological Studies Theological Studies. Yep. Yeah, I remember they changed it. Systematic and historical Keep changing together. the name on me. Right. They just want to remind me how old I am. So uh, <laughs> anyway, so, uh, of Theological Studies, and we're in the series on world religions, and our topic today is Scientology. So this is the one of the newer kids on the block, if I can Relatively, say it that way. Yep. So, um, so we're going to talk through this, and, and Michael, I'm going to let you tell a little bit of your story because you aren't. This isn't just a theoretical exercise right. for you. Um, so, 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 how did a nice guy like you get to a place like this? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. I uh, and I'll give you a short version of it. Uh, you know, I grew up in northern Minnesota. We didn't have a lot going on. We had to make our own fun, um, and I was yeah. <laughs> So I was struggling as a teenager, as most teenagers do, with, oh, all kinds of problems, mostly brought on by bad decisions, sin, uh, but I didn't want to accept that. I was looking for a way out, Mm -hmm. and at that time, there were commercials being run. This was in 1987, 88, commercials being run for... You for really are a young guy. Yes, I am. I yeah. Am. Thank you for pointing <laughs> yeah. that out. Yeah. And uh, so I became attracted to what Scientology or at the time it was just called Dianetics. What it was, mm-hmm. what it was offering me, and got involved in that um, and started in on that for about a year and a half. Uh, the plan was when I turned eighteen, I was going to officially join up. Mm-hmm. Was planning on going to all the way to L.A. to go to school there and join up. And uh, so this is like an um, ROTC. It was or it kind something? of, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, when you're you know when you're underage, you know you can only do so much. But right. um, but for about a year and a half now, I, so I was never officially a member of the Church of Scientology, but I like to say I was I was engaged to be married in my mind. And to you that. knew what it was about. I increasingly became more and more aware mm-hmm. of the depths mm-hmm. of, uh, of its doctrines and teachings. I came from a very nominally Christian background, mm-hmm. not a lot of strong um, doctrinal or, or moral uh, foundation, and so I was always on the lookout for the latest uh, latest fix. So that was my how I got involved so in So where that. in Minnesota are you from? Uh, far, far, almost Canada. Frankly, Almost Canada, yeah, no, far north. The Iron you Range. barely have a passport. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> That's right. I, we're, we're still a part of the union, but <laughs> barely. Yeah, and so there wasn't a lot going on there. The nearest actual. Um, Church of Scientology location was down in the cities, and and that's where I had visited. The, the Twin Cities, I tell you. Yeah, the cities right. are the, the Twin, twin cities, cities, yes. Yeah. So Minneapolis, St. Paul, for yeah, those who were just exactly trying to Exactly, right. Get so I was able to, um, they had an 800 number, and I had a kind of a guy that I would mentor with and read the literature and got more and more involved with uh, um, friends and, and things on my own and involved in some of the auditing sessions and some different things down in the main location when I was able to visit. But the the remoteness of my uh, situation did prevent me from getting deep, more deeply involved in it. Um, and I was scooped up out of that by the grace of God uh, through a high school English teacher hmm. who was also a, a bivocational pastor. And he challenged me, uh, saw me reading some Scientology books and, and challenged me on that um, in a public high school, no hmm. less. And um, it's very interesting. I, I got to tell this part of it. He said, um, saw me reading Dianetics or one of the L. Ron Hubbard books, and he said, uh, he said, oh, L. Ron Hubbard. I said, oh, yeah, you know him? He said, oh, yeah, he's spending an extended vacation in the warmer regions. And I said, no, he died a few years ago. <laughs> he said, that's what I mean. So that was more the confrontational approach uh-huh. to evangelism. Yeah, right, right. And I started arguing with him, and, and he said to me, Someday L. Ron Hubbard is going to disappoint you, and when he does, call me. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, through a series of events. Mm -hmm. I ended up getting my hands on one of the first uh, very difficult to find exposés Mm -hmm. on Scientology. That was very hard to come by in the 80s. Before the internet, before yeah. you could just Google something, yeah, and I got Wasn't on Wikipedia, right? Yet. No, nothing like that. So yeah. I got a copy of the book, uh, read the book, and and I thought, you know. If if just a fraction of this is true, I'm in trouble. Mm-hmm. This is not the the religion for me. And I called him up, and he's the one who then led me led me to the Lord and and discipled me early on. So that's 
uh, in a nutshell, my experience. So about a year and a half, mm -hmm. I was moving deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into uh, on the path of, of Dianetics into Scientology. And then you got deflected. I did, thank mm. God. Uh, so, okay, so look, our, the, way that, the way the series works is we basically ask three core questions. Mm -hmm. What's at the center uh, of this religion? How is it structured? What are its emphases? How is it like and unlike Christianity? And then the second set is, you know, what makes this attractive? What's the draw? Right. And the third is, how does the gospel speak into that draw? Or another way to ask the question is, if you meet someone who's – that's where they're coming from. How do you begin to address them yeah. with regard to the gospel? So let's let's do some part. Let me uh, do a little bit of table setting here. Um, early 1950s, L. Ron Hubbard, basically science fiction writer. He's a science fi yeah, like a pulp science fiction. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And uh, and he produces a book. I think it's in 1953, 1954, called Dianetics. I don't yeah. even know what – does that word mean anything by itself, do you know? Or it, is it? It's allegedly derived from the Greek uh, dia and then nous for through the soul or through the mind. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm – Processing that and going, does that work? <laughs> You're the Greek scholar. It doesn't really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, okay. So so he writes this book, which becomes a pretty widespread bestseller. It draws a lot of attention. It does, right. Has anyone figured out what what the draw of it was? Uh, you know, it was it built itself as the modern science of mental health, kind of a revolution. It was a uh, it, it was a in the hands of lay people, popular level kind of approach to. Uh, self-help or other help. So you were able to take uh, the power of mental health out of the psychoanalyst's hands, the psychiatrist, the institution, mm -hmm. and put it in the hands of normal people. Mm -hmm. And um, so it had that popular appeal. It also, uh, you know, when I picked the thing up and read it, it was easy to understand, but you could tell there was a lot of depth there, and uh -huh. it was it drew, drew you in. Mm -hmm. uh, it was also based on some. It was kind of a mixture, I think, of some commonly accepted psychological principles, some very pragmatic approaches to therapy, Gestalt therapy, and some other things, but also uh, um, what we might call fringe mm -hmm. <laughs> psycho psychological theories. And so it was sort of a mixture, and it really had. A, um, uh, it was something that you could immediately start trying mm -hmm. and uh, had that very practical uh, aspect to it. So I can see why it would be attractive, especially in the 50s, 60s, uh, when people were looking for alternatives to institutionalized religion and Christianity. And, and, and I take it that the the – the payoff, I can say it that way, is is that it kind of helps helps you think about your identity a little bit and kind of how you how you function as a person. And is it that... ex helps you explain uh, why you're having problems, why you're feeling this way, why you act this way. It gives a, a theory for for behavior and then a solution to it, a very practical solution. And and I will say this: Dianetics too is not. There's very little indication that this is a religion. Mm -hmm. Uh, so when you first are introduced to Scientology through Dianetics, um, the religious and spiritual overtones are, are virtually non-existent, mm. and it feels compatible with any kind of religion. So it's you, you only get into the spiritual and the metaphysical stuff um, as you go deeper. That's interesting, So, because that's actually my next question, mm -hmm. which is, uh, you know, originally it was just this book, Dianetics, and Scientology wasn't connected to it. Do you... Do you know the history of how that transition took place and what's going on uh, there? Some, just by what I've read okay. since. At the time, obviously, I didn't know yeah. know the difference. Um, you know, it was it started out as a very uh, L. Ron Hubbard oriented, but apparently, a lot of people were involved in the the formation of some of the theories and practices of Dianetics. Uh, as he kind of took it off in a, a more spiritual direction, some some speculate it was. You know, in order to be a nonprofit religious organization and hmm. avoid paying taxes and such, I don't know if that's true. Yeah. But the point is, he did take it into a more spiritual direction and incorporate the science and the metaphysical, and now you get the best of both worlds. Um, so now, Dianetics and some of the things, the their drug uh, treatment kinds of programs or the self help sort of approaches, uh, anything that you enter into it uh, through a what looks like a harmless um, psychological pop self-help sort of approach is very quickly going to get into the metaphysical and the spiritual. So um, very clearly people realize this is, this is a religious 
So people today will refer to the Church of yeah. Scientology yeah. To, to to make that kind of an indication. Yeah, and with a, and with L. Ron Hubbard, that was something that came several years after mm-hmm. introducing Dianetics as the the modern science of mental health. Okay, so let's let's step back here, and we talk, we're talking about the contents now of Scientology. Yeah. Um, uh, what I mean is there a theology in there of any sure. sort? And, oh, yeah. And, and are there some technical terms associated yeah, with Yeah, there are uh, several. Okay. Um, you know, again, a, as I was introduced to it, we, I was slowly introduced into the idea of um, uh, thetans and uh, past lives and this sort of thing. It's, a, it's kind of a, an amalgam of um, Hinduism, the, mm-hmm. the idea of reincarnation is very po- po- uh, a major part of it. We, we have multiple... Uh, incarnations uh, throughout throughout our, our history for going back possibly trillions of years. Um, we uh, the the anthropology, the doctrine of humanity, is very core there. It's a mm-hmm. very human centered theology. So we are, as it were, essentially spirit beings mm-hmm. trapped in this body. Mm-hmm. The goal, ultimately, if there is an eschatology, is to be released from the body or free from the bodily constraints, um, and we are as it were, div- divine beings of some sort. Hmm. So that's sort of the core of it, and you can see the goal then is through the various processes to um, actualize that and to be to be released. Okay, now you said Thetan, so uh, Thetan. Yeah, Thetan. So, it comes from okay. Theos. So okay. The, for, yeah, uh, uh, we're gonna right. You're gonna be the drawing word on, Theta. You're gonna be dra- drawing on my Greek. All, that is. All the, yep, yep. Okay, I, okay. I figured you'd like that. That's basically um, the goal, ultimate goal uh, of Scientology. This is about where I started to get off of the thing, mm-hmm. get out of it when I realized some of this stuff um, is to be an operating Thetan to be basically free from bodily constraint and be able to do things um, So well, we're really out of spiritual body. beings we in are. the material world is kind of... It's um, very similar to ancient Gnosticism. That's exactly where it's going so Dualistic, next. yes. Yeah. Okay. So there's nothing really new per se, but right. it's kind of a repackaging of a Gnostic kind of, of theology and worldview. Interesting. Um, you know, because Gnosticism, one of the things that has happened in our world today are that Gnostic ideas and Gnostic views have manifested themselves in a variety of ways mm-hmm. today. Mm-hmm. I mean, the whole draw of uh, the Da Vinci Code in the yeah. first decade of, was rooted in similar kinds of things. Um, and this whole idea of the spiritual is what counts and the material right. is denigrated is yeah. a, another element of that. So but let me let me back up, though, okay. to just the, the basic entree into the religion, though, is a very um, – we can help you with your problems. Okay. And – so right. it almost so sounds very, psychological. It is. It's yeah. very much like a you know, in the as you know the in the eighties mm-hmm. and nineties, self help sections of bookstores kept growing. Right. right. Religious sections kept shrinking and yeah. that was it and was. Carl really Imager was writing whatever became exactly. a sin. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. So, so Yeah. Okay. So, it so fit right in there. Okay. Now now there's another we we talked about Thetans. So let's let's talk about another technical term that uh, when you hear it you go, Okay, how's that have anything to do with the Auditing. Yeah. Okay. Auditing has nothing to do with the IRS. Okay, okay that's uh, right. So auditing but, it comes from obviously uh, um, auditory hearing okay. or or listening. The the core religious, I guess, if you would call it practice, or we might even call it psychological counseling aspect of Scientology, which I I did participate in, was um, what they call auditing. Mm -hmm. You could use this thing called an e-meter, which is sort of like a a basic polygraph uh, lie Mm. detector, but you didn't need this. Mm -hmm. Um, And what it was was simply uh, one person with another person. One is the auditor, the other one is the the auditee, the person who is going through it. And you would um, go back in your mind and relive or recount ultimately traumatic episodes in your life experience. Hmm. Um, let's say you were in a car crash mm-hmm. in the age of seven, mm-hmm. and the auditor would lead the person back and have you go through it and describe as many of the feelings but f- more physical um, aspects of that, what you heard, what you saw, and then retell it and retell it and retell it. And the idea is in in circumstances where you endure pain, mm-hmm. suffering, emotional or physical, your data that is collected through your senses is dumped into your unconscious mind and sealed up in there and then starts affecting you mm-hmm. um, 
in your waking so, moment. So there are negative. The thought. idea is to is to unbury that, bring so, it to the surface of consciousness, and then free you from its effects. Okay. I, essentially, there's there's more complicated explanation, but that's the best way. That's what auditing is trying to do. Okay. So it's bringing out. It, it's kind of purging yourself of these negative of this which they called engrams yeah. okay engrams yeah okay things so. written in your okay unconscious that you're not aware of okay and i and think that's a fairly fair estimate that's right even and though so, it's an oversimplification and, and so it, it's to free you of the impact of these yeah. engrams very and, similar to i guess to psychoanalysis in okay that was yeah. the next place very I similar was going. yeah and very in and, and kind of a, if I can say, almost a different form of confession. Yeah. I mean, um, mm-hmm. you know, where I take it the issue is less my responsibility for these things as to how these bad things have impacted. Impacted, me. right? Right. Okay. They, you are the victim of these things, whether you know it or not. So, yeah. you, so you, so you become a. A, a consummate victim who is purging mm-hmm. um, these negative thoughts that impact you in negative ways. Exactly. And, and very quickly, a, a, the explanation, the example that we would always use, whether it's me, realistic or not, uh, you're, a, you're a toddler, you fall down, you get dust in, in your face from the carpet, and you start crying and, and sniffling. Well, years later, you have an, a dust allergy. Uh-huh. So there are certain things that trigger these reactions, psychosomatic reactions. Uh-huh. Every time you smell dust, your unconscious mind is bringing back the tears and the sniffling. That was a bad and now day. you have allergies. Right. And yeah. you don't even know where that came from yeah. until you can, can uncover it and release it. And the idea is you'll be clear eventually of Mm -hmm. these engrams, and you will have no more negative psychological, emotional, or physical effects from these things. So we aren't talking about something that's like the, uh, we're talking about how this is like and unlike Christian faith. We aren't talking about something that's like a salvation, but we're talking about a freeing. Liberation from, yeah. Yeah, Mm -hmm. interesting. Um, and, uh, And then there's, Apparently, a, a, a structure. So you've got these auditors. Are there is are there equivalents to ministers or are these auditors? Those would the be. Those thing would be. Too? That would be basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That would be their. That would be their core, actual religious pro, process. Yeah. So when you, I mean, when you go or participate in a church of Scientology, it's this auditing process that's the primary thing that's happening. Yeah, basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are other exercises once okay. you. But that's the core thing because until you're considered a clear and you, and you that was my goal starting out okay. up the scale to uh, to four point oh clear. Okay. Okay. After that though, there are more okay. levels. So what's a so a clear? Let's explain that. That's yeah, you clear from all of your engrams, including prenatal uh, and your birth. Okay. Anything that has affected you. So the you're clear of those. They're no longer having any effect. I on really you. assume you have a pretty good memory. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So then after that, you can continue up the scale, um, and there are other kinds of exercises similar to the auditing, but you're not, um, well, frankly, um, unlocking engrams from past lives as well. Okay. Moves. That's where it starts to move into, the, the obviously, the metaphysical. So is there... Is there any worship associated with this, or is it no. simply a self-understanding exercise? There's no don't no worship. I mean, we did regard even you know even my shallow exposure, getting deeper into it. L. Ron Hubbard was a, a messianic kind of figure who uh-huh. was who was kind of built this bridge to the truth and discovered this thing or rediscovered this thing, but. Um, there's no worship of L. Ron Hubbard. There's no no worship. They they claim. Uh, and in many cases, it's true, they are compatible with any religion. They mm-hmm. have claimed that. Um, I found they were not compatible with evangelical Christianity when mm-hmm. I became a Christian, that that was incompatible. Yeah. So, but, but for the most part, they will say, well, I'm a Catholic Scientologist or I'm a Buddhist Scientologist or because, as you can see, it's... Um, it's not competing. It's not competing with yeah. the worship of a different god, right. per se. Okay. Yeah, which yeah. makes it attractive right. in some ways. Right. Well, I don't have to give up the religion of my parents to be a Scientologist. Now, I imagine that that um, that uh, you've pondered this question in one form or another, and that is this 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 movement has actually kind of caught on in pockets of Hollywood. Sure. Uh, and mm-hmm. um, you know, we got prominent. Yeah. Uh, figures who've been associated with this. And in fact, my, when I told my wife that we were doing this podcast, she says, you know, uh, the cover story on People Magazine this week is on uh, is on someone who's trying to leave the Church of Scientology mm-hmm. and has been 
pursued by mm. the church because they've been so public about their mm. distancing, distancing of the faith, yeah. which is a whole other dimension of this. There's there's someone who watches over, I guess, the public image of mm. Scientology yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Um, and uh, is it is it is it the psychotherapeutic aspects of Scientology that you think make it attractive to someone? In Hollywood, I mean, uh, are, can you have any explanation? Yeah, for I, re- I really don't know. I think, it, uh, I mean, the thing is centered in L.A. Yeah, uh, and so in in yeah, it, I've it, driven by the main early, church, right? On the yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. earliest uh, pockets of followers were from there, and so it had an influence on, in Hollywood. I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any reasonable explanation for that. Probably just sociological explanations. Um, I would say most. Most people I've talked to people in Hollywood, and they say, "Look, um, they don't. They have kind of a neutral attitude toward religion. As long as you don't mess with production, they really care mostly about making <laughs> about money, film. right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, whether you're a Christian, Buddhist, Scientologist, as long as you don't start messing with the production, it's fine. Um, and so I think, though, it, it's just um, certain key famous actors and actresses, um, at least in the '80s." Um, were used as PR magnets, so mm-hmm. and they really don't like. Uh, well, who, what religion does will like bad press, right right? right? right, right, right. But the critics and such, calling it a cult and calling it these kinds of things, are are you know really upsetting, I suppose, to any religion. Mm-hmm. So, so, so you're in, so in a, someone who's involved in this. I mean, I'm talking about your past mm-hmm. involvement. They're they're reading and auditing. I mean, is that basically what's happening? We're reading books. There's some self um, evaluation exercises you can do. There's there are other kinds of um, thought. I remember uh, one time we we were I was led through a um, uh, series of questions like, um, "What could you have done today?" Mm-hmm. And then you say, and then they ask you it again, "What could you have done today?" And this was this was just these things where they're they're intended to. Um, Expand your creativity, expand your mind. You know, you're growing you being more self-aware. Yeah, being more self-aware. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay. Yeah. So, um, it it sounds like it was fun. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it's just interesting, kind of fun, a different kind of a therapy, different way of yeah, spending your time. <laughs> <laughs> interesting. Well, um, okay, so we've kind of gotten the flavor of what uh, Scientology is and how it works and some of the terminology that's associated with it, that kind of thing. And the one thing we didn't raise, we talked a little bit about anthropology and about the kind of the almost the therapeutic qualities of, of Scientology. We didn't talk a little bit about uh, about any sense of eschatology or afterlife or anything mm-hmm. like that. How does how do, does Scientology approach those questions at all? Yeah, it does it, it, in some ways. Ultimately, the the major emphasis is on a uh, a quality of life now, at mm-hmm. least initially. Um, but ultimately, the goal is an escape from bodily constraints, bodily existence, and to be um, uh, in, I mentioned in the before the break that uh, it's very similar to Gnosticism. The idea is that you are you have been trapped. Mm-hmm. You are essentially spiritual being trapped in a in a physical body and universe. The goal is to be freed from that. In the meantime, there is the cyclic the cyclical um, reincarnation thing that we are a part of. So I would say it's very similar in some regards to um, Buddhism or Hinduism with a with an emphasis on reincarnation and the goal ultimately is escape from that. Not nirvana, not a melding with the oneness of the universe. Uh-huh. Uh, it's very individualistically uh, oriented, but the goal is to an, to an escape ultimately. There isn't a dying and going to heaven, there isn't resurrection. Um, it is really a, a escape from the constraints of the physical realm. So it's conceivable then that some of the people, when they're being audited and that kind of thing, can can not only reflect on this life, but they might reflect on a uh, on a claim of having had a previous life or something like that. That that can go on. Yes. Oh yeah. 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 Um, and as I, like I mentioned about, I was getting deeper and deeper into it for about a year and a half, and and toward the end, that's that was a, a major topic that came up that really challenged me. I had never really really believed in reincarnation, and and um, when this came up, the idea of past lives and and clearing out past lives and the effects that those are even having on you. Um, it it's one of the things that really started to to cause me to doubt whether this is really the modern science of mental health or 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 just a religion that it, 
that I, do I really want to be a part of that? And, and, and in wrestling with that, I mean, there's almost an endless dimension to it in terms of the way in which it can capture your attention mm-hmm. and then – well, okay, all right. So we've done a good job of thinking about this time around. We can yeah. now let's go and delve back into the past and the deeper and long, and, and deeper how goes, many, the longer the it goes. longer you can go. There, there is, a, in a sense, a an endless path. It's, at the beginning, you think, well, if I just get to level four, I'll be clear and you know I can move on. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, there are multiple levels of to uh, you know an operating thetan and. And these abilities and the depth and, and going all the way back, um, almost an infinite regression um, backwards through past lives. So, um, you know, and, and as people get involved in it, they're spending time, they're spending energy, they're, they're, they have, they're giving up relationships in order to be more involved in the church. Uh, they've spent a lot of money. It's really hard when you start to realize that maybe you, this was a mistake. Mm-hmm. It's really hard to back out of that, mm-hmm. you know, and... Um, yeah, huh. very difficult. Okay, so that's that's kind of the character uh, of Scientology. Mm-hmm. Let's talk a little bit about the other elements. Which is so what what is your sense of the attraction of Scientology? Yeah. I, I mean, the, the, what is coming across to me, I think, pretty clearly is people are given a sense that they can understand themselves better. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and and so that seems to be the big driver in a lot of yeah. ways. One of the a couple terms that. That stick out. Um, I mean, it was called the modern science of mental health. The, they had really flashy commercials on TV, uh-huh. so they, were, they they had a really great and still do a pretty glossy, flashy PR campaign. And so they knew how to. They also targeted. Um, they targeted people. I realized that were uh, above average intelligence, had some. Uh, weren't super in a super bad condition, uh-huh. like crazy people. Right. Um, people who had minor problems and could and could easily be helped and assisted. So, uh, and they targeted them with um, terms like truth. Mm-hmm. I will tell you one thing that it really appealed to me is uh, it, it appealed to my pride. Mm-hmm. Um, not only was it going to solve my problems, which is a, a obviously an appeal if you have a, if you're a teen with all kinds of problems. But you were being given the truth that that L. Ron Hubbard and the Dianetics Foundation and Scientology had unveiled, and everybody else was wrong. Uh-huh. The psychiatrists were wrong. The psychologists were wrong. The medical community, everybody else was wrong. We alone had this this truth and this bridge to freedom. Mm. And there's something really attractive to that as it's you know stroking your pride uh-huh. and gives you something to argue about with other people right and so that's going to attract a certain kind of person usually with people with with strong personalities and mm-hmm. uh, and it did it attracted me is there any you know in, in the Christian experience of course community is an important thing mm-hmm. is there any kind of community dimension to this or is it pretty much a privatized uh, therapy both. Both. Um, so there are things you can do on your own. They had a book that I had gone through and others had gone through called Self Analysis, I think it was called, and there were exercises you could go through. Um, but you also had the camaraderie of, look, we are the community of the truth, of the, of the, you know, the re- restoration of humanity here. And we really thought we could um, ultimately bring people to a, we would end wars and end poverty and end addictions. But there is also the one-on-one aspect uh-huh. of the auditing process. Right. Um, how often do we as Christians sit down across from the table and try to hammer out and work out each other's problems? Mm-hmm. Not very often. Yeah. And so there is something like that that's, that's, that's really missing. There's interpersonal. Yeah, that interpersonal and we're struggling in this together, which was, uh, it, it, felt, it felt good. Now y- you've raised another category that often gets associated with religion that is probably worth probing here, and that is: is there any kind of uh, social ethic or anything that? I mean, is there a benefit of being a clear? Does it does it clean you up to be able to yeah, there, serve people in other ways or that kind of that dimension? Or is ultimately, there some- yeah. Um, I, I, although 
you know, I had a I had a girlfriend at the time who was really bad off, and I was told a number of times by my mentor to just forget about her. She's beyond help, and you know, uh-huh. um, she's on on psychoactive drugs. She's on medication. There's nothing we can do for her. So there was a point where it it hardly becomes worth working on some people. Mm-hmm. So that was the impression I got. On the other hand. Um, they do have, they did have, uh, and, and still have drug addiction recovery type things, and and helping uh, social social act, action and such. One thing um, they were very much opposed to abortion. They're mm-hmm. pro-life. They had certain very strict standards in certain areas of morality. Uh, so, yeah, it was. Um, there was a moral code. It wasn't quite Christian, but it was was. Um, you you were living a certain way and expected to to uh, um, yeah function a certain level of morality. Now, uh, uh, because it's coming out of the '50s and then went through the '60s and '70s in its development, uh, the, this is I think is a natural question. That is, I, I take it that one of the attractions is almost besides self awareness is almost a self actualization mm-hmm. that comes out yeah. of it. That 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 you put yourself because you understand who you are better you put yourself into the position of being a better person and you become more confident you mm-hmm. more successful uh-huh. um, the uh, your reaction time is increased mm-hmm. physically as well as mentally you're mm-hmm. more alert you're more uh, and so that's what's kind of a, a, prom- a promised um, that you are going to be able to uh, use there's a film back in the day, mm-hmm. uh, Phenomenon, I think, or Phenomena it was called, with mm-hmm. John Travolta, mm-hmm. where he gets zapped, mm-hmm. and uh, for the first time, he, he's able to use his mind in its full capacity. That really was a, a metaphor, in huh. some sense, for John Travolta, of course, being a Scientologist. Right. That was a metaphor for what they were trying to accomplish. Huh. We're using this much of our brain instead of this much, and what Scientology is promising is you're going to be able to use much more of your your senses in your brain and be in more control of your of your life. That's very attractive. Yeah. To so a lot of people. So so now so now let's talk. Let's turn the page here and, and talk about how the gospel walks into this. Uh, and, and in in one sense, it seems to me the gospel can walk right into this desire for self awareness mm-hmm. and can can talk about who we are as people. What is my we, real problem? Yeah. Right? Yeah. All yeah. those kinds of things mm-hmm. that, that, that that door looks to be completely open as a way Absolutely. of approach. Um, and now, in Scientology, I was told that we were basically neutral or good okay, um, and ultimately, in some sense, divine, and we have this clutter that we need to clear out. Mm-hmm. Um, that was the truth of, of humanity as it was told to me. Uh, Christianity came at it with acknowledging the same problems. I had relationship problems. I had sin problems. I had all kinds of issues. Um, but the but the truth from Christianity that was shared with me was diametrically opposed. It was a complete alternative. In fact, uh, you know, the guy who led me to the Lord said, you know, um, someday I want to share with you the other side of that. Uh-huh. You know, and so the the problem of humanity and suffering and limitations and, and agony that we're in is, is fully acknowledged. The and solution self under, is the different. pursuit of self-understanding. Self-understanding and yeah. what, why am I behaving this way? Right. Um, totally legitimate question. And mm-hmm. so we can come in and say, look, um, the problem is not that you're basically good and have a bunch of clutter. Uh-huh. The problem is um, well, you got clutter, sin. but yeah, <laughs> like you got clutter. You got clutter, but, it, but it's not um, inflicted on right, you. Right. Exactly. Yeah. The problem yeah. really is sin. And so, yeah. to, for me to take make that change from my problem is uh, engrams, uh, you know, a faulty function of my of my reactive mind and my, you know, that's sort of blaming something else. I had to take the blame myself and mm-hmm. say, actually, I'm a sinner. Yeah, my I call it owning problem, your own owning junk. Owning my own junk, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah. And um, you know, making that, t- coming to that conclusion, that was the truth. Mm-hmm. That was the truth. That was a, a very important step. Um, I would also say, too, um, the idea to escape from these things that are influencing me and to be released to a life that is fulfilling happy, joyous, uh, that's something, too, that Christianity offers. Uh, interestingly, as I was going through the, the process of Dianetics and the Scientology stuff, um, my relationships with friends and family were getting no better. 
Hmm. In some ways, I was being moved farther and farther away from those things. Because you become more self-focused, I would it, take it. I was, and, and yeah. more focused on the on the religion itself. Yeah. When I became a Christian, mm-hmm. um, those relationships, the the broken relationships that originally drew me to Scientology that were not healed, began to be healed. Hmm. Um, because now I'm approaching it from a perspective of of humility, mm-hmm. my own brokenness, mm-hmm. um, deferring to others, and that's when my my family relationship with my parents, my relationship with friends, began to be um, redeemed. And so, Christianity offers redemption, not just escape, not just separation from the physical world and the body, but a redemption, a reowning, and a a reappropriation of that in a positive direction that mm-hmm. was revolutionary for me. So um, so this guy had said to you, um, you know, when he begins to disappoint you, give me a call. Did you give him a call? I did. I had uh, – I, I probably would have – I mean, I made fun of him, laughed at him. Mm-hmm. But uh, a couple months later, it was, uh, I was, it was Easter weekend. I was at a Star Trek Doctor Who sci-fi fantasy convention, which is a whole, other, a whole yes. moment, another conversation. <laughs> but uh, but I was there, and that's where I stumbled upon this uh, first printing uh-huh. book that was an expose of Scientology um, called L. Ron Hubbard Messiah or Madman. Grabbed the thing, read the thing in that weekend, and I. That's where I realized, you know, wait, what did he? What did he, what did he say? He said, oh, some that da- someday L. Ron Hubbard will disappoint you when yeah. he does call him." So I got home and called him up, and um, and he said, "Yeah, you know, I was still in high school. He was a teacher. He said, you know, ask your parents if it's okay. Come over, and we'll and I'll share with you the other side of this." And um, I didn't ask my parents' permission. Yeah, we didn't have that kind of relationship. <laughs> so I drove over to his house, and he he and his wife shared with me. And you know, I was, um, he was praying for me. Uh huh. Okay. I had other people in my life praying for me that thought I was or knew I was going down the wrong path. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't want to want anybody to think that there wasn't a spiritual, supernatural element to this. But the Lord, through these people's prayers and through orchestrating these things at a sci-fi fantasy convention of all things, That's right. the Lord was intervening and orchestrating these things to put me to a place. I like to say, you know, had he shared the gospel with me a week earlier, mm-hmm. I would have laughed at him. Mm-hmm. You know, a week later, maybe I would have found some other offbeat religion, you know, to follow. Mm-hmm. But the Lord orchestrated those things. And so so as far as approaching people who are in any different religion, any different worldview, there is a level of of um, blindness, uh, of unwillingness, stubbornness that can only be addressed through prayer and fasting. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, I would say we need to start Certain things there. are above our pay grade. They are definitely. Yeah. yeah we, can, we, can, we can proclaim. Uh-huh. We can answer questions. And we're asked to be faithful. And we can tell them, you know, here's the problem. Here's our solution. Mm-hmm. Um, but if we're not bathing that in prayer and, and uh, you know, the Lord has to do his work. And that was, I think, the key to my, my conversion. So do you have any sense that the, this <clears throat> teacher who shared with you knew very much about Scientology, or was he just being faithful to the Christian message that he had? Amazing question. Okay. Um, this guy had a daughter hmm. that had actually, and I think even to this day, gotten sucked into Scientology and was, is still involved in it. Hmm. So he already was aware of its dangers, already was aware of you know, what can happen when somebody gets drawn away from it and uh, was aware of its tenets. Even mm-hmm. back in the day when it was very difficult to find um, negative press on it, he, mm-hmm. he was aware of this. And so when he saw me there getting deeper into it, uh, he knew. I can imagine he was on his knees, yeah. you know, trying to... Interesting. You know, so yeah, but what does that tell you? Yeah. He was aware, uh-huh. he was aware of the dangers, and he knew how to deal with it. That, um, that line... Uh, someday L. Ron Hubbard is going to disappoint you when he does call me. Uh, that was ingenious. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. because he knew eventually there would be a moment. There was going to yeah. be some doubts, right? Yeah. There was going to be some some conflicting, you know, worldview issues that that I was experiencing, and and even though he knew it, I was in no position to listen at the time. This is one thing, too, with our evangelism and our engaging with people of other faiths, is we do need to have a longer view and be patient mm-hmm. as well, understanding that our job is not to, 
to browbeat them into the kingdom, but to proclaim. Mm -hmm. And um, we have a a better truth, a truth that's actually true. Yeah, and it's and and be confident a, in the word. And it's of the a spirit. truth we can be patient about. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and I, I, yeah, I, I agree. I think that the, you know, most of what we do when we talk about sharing and mission here is engaged in in what at least when I was involved in the church early on, what's called friendship evangelism, where you just yeah. come and we're just you're relating to people and you're 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 showing you're showing the authenticity of the Christian faith. Yeah. And uh, and and that is a long term deal. I yeah. mean, you know, that's uh, my own testimony is is that it was the faithful life of many people living out their Christian life that yeah. got my attention. Yeah. And said there's something going on with the way that they're living and the way that they're viewing life, and the way they're able to deal with, with the hard things of life that, that's different. Yeah, and you know, it's kind of funny that after I, I converted and, and accepted Christ and he began discipling me, you know, I had a little cleanup to do because I had been, you know, a couple weeks clear. earlier. You had well, to get clear. <laughs> a couple weeks earlier, I was, I was trying to wrangle all my friends into Scientology. Uh -huh. And so now, it, it was kind of, you know, you're, you're tucking your tail between your legs and uh -huh. you're kind of sheepishly going back. That was an exercise in humility because I had to say everything I said before, totally wrong. Yeah. But this, yeah. this is – and interestingly – So why should we believe you exactly, now? Exactly. Yeah. You know? so, but interestingly, when I, when I did go back to, to them, they said, you know, we didn't really buy that Scientology stuff anyway. We were <laughs> yeah. just trying to not you know, make yeah. you upset. Um, they were very open to it mm -hmm. because, uh, again, you know, I began praying for them. Mm -hmm. I began sharing with them, and so uh, many of my friends, uh, you know, alt also embraced Christianity. We had a bit of a revival going on there mm -hmm. in northern Minnesota. Interesting. Um, so yeah, it's uh, you know, the Lord works as works through various ways, and um, in this in this way, it was not, no major damage done. Not a, one of my friends ever became a. A Scientologist, ultimately. Interesting. Uh, so, so the uh, I guess the way of talking about the way into the mm -hmm. uh, attraction is to help people see who they really are before God, yeah, and to and to make clear. <laughs> Unlike Scientology, you don't fix yourself. Yeah, that's right. And you don't bring people. There aren't people that you bring around you that fix you. Mm -hmm. Okay, that the fix is found in the goodness, grace, kindness, mercy. Absolutely, of yeah. God and what He has done through Christ. In the, and I clearly remember the a distinct moment where I, when I switched, realized I was switching worldviews. Here was um, the bad news side of the gospel. Uh -huh. You know, there's the good news, but right. the bad news is about us. And right. uh, the idea that no, I'm not just dirty. Mm -hmm. That I just need to be cleared out. Um, there's something uh, that I can't fix. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, it is something that happened in the past, and I'm uh, uh, at the result of this fall, and I've I am an, a mortal person who's broken. I can't fix that, mm -hmm. and um, that was a light bulb co going on. You know, the interesting thing about this conversation is is that um, when we only portray ourselves as a victim, mm -hmm. the forces are coming at us from the outside, and it's the outside that's the problem. Yeah. We actually prevent ourselves from seeing that which we desperately need mm -hmm. and why we are actually ultimately responsible for even the way we react to those outside forces, et cetera. And, and in the process, you distance yourself from the realization that's basic that walks you into a world of grace. Yeah. Um, you know, it, 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 it's no accident that Scripture portrays sin as a, as a debt. Yeah. And a debt that I am responsible for having and created can't pay. and right. cannot pay. Yeah. And so, you know, there's a wonderful passage in Scripture that says, you know, the one who's forgiven little loves little, yeah. but the one who's forgiven much loves much. Yeah. Yeah. And I often like to say that when it comes to the grace of God, if you don't realize how much it is that you have been forgiven of, you don't understand mm -hmm. the depths of the of the problem that resides within you. Don't don't. Make yourself a victim and say it's all their fault. Or it's mm, all coming right. from the outside, yeah. but actually own it, mm. uh, and then you recognize it's something you can't fix. Then you realize what grace and mercy yeah. is. Yeah, and out of grace and mercy come gratitude. Yeah, and devotion and appreciation and an ability really to form an identity that allows the allegiance that you have to walk with God. I think it's a very 
core element of identity and a core element of building the kind of the right kind of foundation for the Christian faith. Yeah, yeah and I and here I was stuck between these very opposite worldviews and truth claims, both calling themselves the truth. Right. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free, as Christ said. And He is the way, the truth, and the life. I had to reckon with. Um, which truth am I going to embrace? And, and ultimately, yeah, the, the Christian faith was transformative and redemptive. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was not an escapism. It was a, a redemptive approach to life and to, and to my existence, my relationships, uh, where I got kind of the opposite feeling uh, in Scientology. Yeah, I, I think it's one of the, um, like I said, one of the, one of the, dangers and travails of the world that we live in that when we make everything around us or the environment that turns us into victims, we're actually at the same time cutting ourselves off from the very awareness that mm-hmm. we need in order to experience the depths of the grace of God. Right. And it's one of the ways in which the world uh, deceives us. It deceives us by saying the problems are out there and you're simply this neutralized victim that's been yeah. and, it, and it's not that. Well, Michael, I really appreciate you taking yeah. the time Thank to you. come in and talk with us about Scientology, help us think through uh, what this this movement is particularly probably, uh, well, it's a worldwide movement, but it, mm-hmm. it started out in the States, of course, mm-hmm. and uh, understanding it and uh, appreciate you taking the time. Yeah. To be Thank with you us. so much for having me. And we're pleased that you could be a part of the table and we look forward to having you back again with us soon. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.